بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله <تصفيق> السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله We would like to welcome you back to our second session regarding life after death <تصفيق> Today's session is regarding two aspects and what is uh, one is the actual aspects of death what happens in terms of the departure of the soul and the second part is the life of the grave al hayat al barzakhiyah the interspace life inshallah ta'ala uh, brothers inshallah if we can uh, come closer inshallah that uh, we follow the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mashallah unless you are Somebody with age and a very, very back, bad back. Mashallah, the Sheikh here is in the front line here, and I think he's. Uh, I think there's a lot of people younger than the Sheikh here. So, Mashallah, he's a uh, Mashallah an example, Qudwa for us, Mashallah. Tayyib. Bismillah. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, in Arabic we have two words or two terms. One we call ruh, and the other is nafs. Now, when we talk about ruh. And nafs, they are similar words. In fact, they are interchangeable. We can use them to mean the same thing, basically. However, uh, when we talk about the nafs, it's normally in the context of it being connected to the body while you're alive, basically. And when we talk about the ruh, the ruh is when the soul, when it's disconnected from the body. So there are two terms here that we use. Now, when we're talking about the soul itself, the scientists and the philosophers, they've tried to explain it. What is the soul? Yet, they can't quantify it. They can't put a measure to it. It's immeasurable. In fact, we heard that even some scientists try to measure the mass of a, a body of a person just before his death and straight after his death to see does the soul have any kind of volume or does it have any kind of mass to it? Of course, inconclusive. You know, they, they couldn't prove anything. And the reason why is because of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الروح, And they ask you, meaning the Prophet sallam, concerning the ruh, the spirit, قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي وَمَا أُوْتِيْتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا That the, the ruh is of one of the things, the knowledge of which is only with my Lord, meaning with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of knowledge, you meaning mankind, have only been given a little. So it is one of the mysteries that still hasn't been fathomed, hasn't been worked out. The soul... If we look at it in its relationship to the body, a body without a soul is lifeless. What makes us living is the ruh, is the soul that we have inside there. Once you remove this, it's just jism, it's a body, it's a, it's a corpse. So really, you know, the, the doctors, they say, in order for a person to be alive, he must have so much brain activity, he must have, you know, a ventilation rate, he must have a heart rate and so forth. All these are physiological things. <laughs> which occur whilst the soul is in the body. But if that soul has left the body, all these things will cease, they will stop. In terms of the departure of the soul, of how the soul leaves us, before we get on to that part, you know, we have to understand one thing. That death is predestined. It's been written for us. Its place and it's time, this has been determined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we refer back to the hadith of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu an, who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa narrated to us that verily the creation of each one of you is brought together in his mother's womb for 40 days in the form of a nutfa, a drop. And then it becomes an alaqa, a clot, a clot of blood for a like period. And then a mudgha, mudgha is like a, a piece of, of meat, flesh. When you chew it up, okay, it looks like that. 
for a like period. Then there is sent to him the angel who blows his soul into him, and who was commanded with four matters to write down his risk, his sustenance, his provisions, his lifespan, his actions, and whether he'll be happy or unhappy. So in this, the lifespan is mentioned. His birth and his death, or of course, if it's female, her death, her birth, her death. So this is part of the Muslim's belief. So when people talk about premature death, this person died prematurely, or baby died prematurely, no, 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 no. There's no such thing as a premature death or an early death. Death before his days, na'udhu billah. Why? Because from our belief, our aqidah, is that death has been written with a set time, date, place. And the knowledge of that is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So this is from our aqidah. So when you hear these terms, don't be fooled by them. In fact, they are going towards kufr. Because it's disbelieving on what the Prophet ﷺ revealed, and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. So, death is determined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Death itself, as an event, death is painful. It is painful. Even though the one who's dying, you may not see any signs of pain on him or her, or distress or anguish. And it might be, as they say in, in inverted commas, uh, a peaceful death. There's no such thing as a peaceful death in that respect. Why? That in the Sakrat al that in the pangs of death there is pain. In the last moments of dying, there is great pain there. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and the stupor of death will come in truth. It will come as a reality. This is what you have been avoiding. If you remember, in the last session we discussed about at the time of death, that it is a great test. It is a great test for a believer. Why? Because in such pain and agony, if the shaitan gets that person, he can renounce his faith and lose iman. So it is only the strong believer or those who Allah has mercy upon that will die in that state of iman, state of faith. Those who have that strong faith, they're the ones who will be, inshaAllah, dying upon iman. How does death begin? No death occurs except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed it. And for it to occur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the angel of death. Now there are many uh, opinions given as to his name. Like Jibreel alayhi salam is the angel in charge of revelation. You have Mikael alayhi salam. And you have other angels with specific names. Israfil who blow the horn. However, we don't have any authentic evidence to say or to verify that the angel of death has a specific name. Allahu Akbar. So we refer to him as Malik al Maut, the angel of death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qul yatawafakum malakum malakul maut. قُلْ يَتَوَفَّاكُمْ مَلَكُ الْمَوْتِ الَّذِي وَكُكِّلَ بِكُمْ ثُمَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ تُرْجَعُونَ The angel of death who is set or is set over you will take your souls. So this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen this one angel. His role, his job is to take the souls of everybody, young and old, male or female, Muslim or non-Muslim. Then Allah says, ثُمَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ تُرْجَعُونَ then to your Lord, you will, be, you will return back again. At the point of death, there are certain common physical characteristics you'll see. And one of those is if you look at the person who's dying, his eyeballs start to roll upwards. So you see the white part of the eye, the sclera. This is what you'll start seeing. In many cases, it's very common. 
And this is in accordance with the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, where he said in the meaning that when the ruh, when the soul is taken out, the eyesight follows it as it ascends. The eyesight follows it as it ascends, as we'll discover a bit later, inshallah. Imam Ahmad in his collection of hadith reports regarding what Al Bara bin Azib said. He said that we were the mess- we were with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they were there to attend a, a funeral procession of a, a man from the Ansar. We reached the gravesite when it had not yet been completed. The Messenger of Allah sat and we sat all around him as if there were birds hovering over our heads. The Prophet was holding a piece of wood in his hand, poking the ground with it. He next raised his head and said two or three times, Asta'idhu billahi min adhab al qabr, which means seek refuge with Allah from the punishment of the grave. Then he said, When a believing slave is reaching the end of his term in the life of this world and the beginning of this term in the hereafter, a group of angels whose faces are white and as radiant as the sun will descend onto him from heaven. They will carry with them a white shroud from paradise and fragrance for enshrouding from paradise. They will sit as far for him as the sight goes. Then the angel of death will come until he sits right next to his head saying, O oh good and pure soul, Depart your body and you come out of your body to Allah's forgiveness and pleasure. So the soul flows out just as a drop flows out from the tip of the jug. And the angel of death captures it. When he captures the soul, the group of angels, they will not leave it with him for more than an instance. And they will seize it and wrap it in that shroud. And the angels will ascend to heaven. They will not pass by, but they will say, Whose is this tayyib, this good soul? And the angels who are sending will reply to the other angels, Such and such a person, he was son of such a person, such a person. And they'll call him by the best names that used to be called in the world. They'll reach the lower heaven and they'll ask that his door be open for him. And it will be open for them. And the best residents of every heaven will then see him to the next heaven until he's brought to the seventh heaven. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, list my servant's record in Iliyin and send him back to earth. Which is a, a book. For I've created them from it and into it I shall return them. And from it I shall bring them out once again. Then that person's soul will be joined back to the body. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals in the, has revealed in the Qur'an. الَّذِينَ تَتَوَفَّاهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ طَيْبِينَ يَقُولُونَ يَقُولُونَ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمُ دُخُلُ الْجَنَّةِ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ دُخُلُ الْجَنَّةَ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ those whose lives the angels take while they are in a pious state, meaning pure from evil and worshipping only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with tawheed. They say to them, Salamun alaykum, peace be upon you. Enter you into paradise because of the good which you used to do, meaning in this world. So this is a state of the believer. That at that moment in time, when the soul is taken, he will be in bliss. But what about the death of those who were disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sinners, and those who were disbelievers, non-Muslims, kuffar? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about them. وَلَوْ تَرَى إِذِ الظَّالِمُونَ فِي غَمَرَاتِ الْمَوْتِ وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ بَاسِطُوا وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ بَاسِطُوا وَيْدِيهِمْ أَخْرِجُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ 
اليوم تجزون عذاب الهون بما كنتم تقولون تقولون على الله غير الحق وكنتم وكنتم عن آياته تستكبرون and if you could see if you could see but when the ظالمون those who are the wrongdoers those who are mushriks who are praying other than to Allah whilst they're in the agonies of death while the angels stretching forth their hands saying deliver your souls hand over your souls this day shall you be recompensed you'll be given back with the torment of degradation because of what you used to utter against Allah other than the truth and you used to reject his ayat meaning his this Quran and the proofs and the sunnah and this deen used to reject his ayat with disrespect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ تَتَوَفَّاهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ ظَالِمِي أَنفُسِهِمْ Those whose lives the angels take while they are doing wrong to themselves, meaning by disbelief, by doing shirk, by doing sins, all kinds of haram actions. Then the angels say to them, فَأَلْقَوْا السَّلَمَ مَا كُنَّا نَعْمَلُ مِنْ سُوءٍ In fact, those people will say, they will try to defend themselves, the wrongdoers. They will say, saying falsely of course, we didn't do any actions that were evil, we weren't the evildoers. So this will, they'll try to make an excuse. And what will be the reply by the angels? The angels will reply to them, بَلَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ Yes, truly Allah is all knower of what you used to do. Subhanallah then. They can deny, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be witness. And He is all knower of what we used to do. So, what will be the end of such people? They will be told, فَدَخُلُوا أَبْوَابَ جَهَنَّمْ Enter into Jahannam. فَدَخُلُوا أَبْوَابَ جَهَنَّمَ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا Enter into the gates of Jahannam, into the gates of hell. There you'll live forever. فَلَبِئْسَ مَثْوَ الْمُتَكَبِّرِينَ And that is the evil destination, the evil abode for those who are the arrogant. So when a disbeliever is reaching the end of his life, the Prophet ﷺ told us that this is the beginning of his life of the hereafter. And he said, they'll descend to that person, angels from heaven with dark faces. They'll bring with them musuh. Musuh is a rough, rough, cloth sack and will sit as far from him as a sight reaches then the angel of death will come forward and sit right next to his head saying to him oh impure evil soul depart from your body come out of your body to the anger of Allah and a wrath from him and that soul of that person, the evil person of the non, of this believer, it will it wouldn't want to come out. It will scatter through the rest of the body, it will try to disperse. But the angel of death will take that soul, it will seize it, will grab it. And when he does, he removes that ruh. And it comes out like you have a cotton wool dragging on thorns. It comes out like that. And the angels, when they see, they don't leave that, 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 that soul, even for an instance. They will wrap it in that rough, coarse sack of a shroud. The soul will be wrapped into it. And it will have the most evil, the most horrible smell of rotting dead flesh. And then the angels will pass by, the other angels will rise with this soul. And the angels will ask, who is this evil soul? And they'll call it by the worst names known in this world. And when they reach the lowest heaven, they'll ask for the door to be open, but the request will be denied. 
This Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah. لا تفتح لهم أبواب السماء ولا يدخلون الجنة From the gates, for them, the gates of heaven will not be open. لا تفتح لهم أبواب السماء ولا يدخلون الجنة حتى يلج الجمل في سم الخياط that the soul will not be allowed into Jannah, the gates of Jannah will not be open for it until, until a camel passes through the eye, the, needle of, the eye of a needle. Is it possible? Can a camel pass through the eye of a needle? No. Never. Never. Meaning they will never go to Jannah. That is a guarantee by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his statement. It's an impossibility, so don't expect it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will declare, list his record in Sijin, in the lowest earth. And then that wicked soul will then be thrown down from the heavens, where he'll, his soul will then rejoin his body. And this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran. وَمَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَكَنَّمَا خَرَّ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فَتَخْطَفُهُ الطَّيْرُ فَتَخْطَفُهُ الطَّيْرُ وَوْتَحْوِهِ بِهِ الرِّيحُ فِي مَكَانٍ سَحِيقٌ And whoever assigns partners to Allah, meaning make shirk, it is as if he had fallen from the sky and the birds snatched him, or the wind had thrown him to a far off place. This is the situation of the disbelievers so once that soul returns back to the body we now come to the next stage and that is the life of the grave al hayat al barzakhiyah the life of the grave we mentioned again last time this is what we call the interspace life separating the life of heaven and the life of the earth that we've just been through. In death, as we said before, that the body remains in the ground, stays there. But it is the, the soul, the ruh, that's between the two places. It is a soul that lives the Hayat al barzakhiyah Either, as we mentioned last time, there will be either bliss, pleasure, or punishment. But for some, there may be a bit of both. <coughs> this is dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what He wills for that person. And we mentioned that the soul can be diffused in more than one place. And the evidence for this is that we saw, uh, the, the Prophet sallallahu saw Musa alayhi salam on the night journey. And he saw him standing, praying in his grave. But he also saw him in the sixth and seventh heavens. So the scholars have mentioned that the soul is connected to more than one place. <clears throat> in this part of the existence of the soul, there, there will be basically two groups. Those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy will be upon. Those who are strong and firm believers who obeyed the book of Allah and follow the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Normally, most people don't like to talk about the grave because it, it brings thoughts of death and fear. And rightly it should do. Because none of us should think that when we depart from this world, everything's going to be nice and rosy and cozy. That is not the way that we should be dealing with our lives. Nobody has given us a green card or nobody has given us a, a guarantee that we're going to be living that life of Bliss in the grave. Do we? Not a single one of us. Those souls which will live the life of bliss, those souls which will visit each other as well. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن يُتِعِ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ وَحَسُنَ أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا Whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger, 
They're with those whom Allah has blessed. The prophets, the sincere, the martyrs and the righteous. Verily, or very excellent companions they are. So they will be visiting each other, the souls. In fact, once the person has been laid in the grave, then what we know from the authentic hadith, when the sandals of the last person move away, have left, two angels will come, dark colored, blue faced, very scary. They will come and they'll sit that person up in the grave. But one is called Munkir and then called Nakir. They will ask, Man Rabbuk, who is your Lord? Who is your Lord? Allah. Easy to say today, it, even a child can say it. What's your religion? Islam. It's easy for an adult to say it. Who is your prophet? Muhammad Sallallahu Even the elderly can say it. But on that day, don't think these answers will come so easy. On that day, it will be a different story. No use taking a piece of paper and putting it in the grave with us. It's not going to help us. That day will be a very, very hard day to answer those questions. For sure. The believers, they will say, Rabbi Allah, Allah is my Lord. Wa deen al-Islam. And Islam is my, my religion, my deen. Wa Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Muhammad was my, is my prophet. Yes, that will be the case for the believers. And then they will be told, you've said the truth. You've said the truth. You've lived on this. You died on it. And you'll be resurrected on it. Inshallah, may Allah make us amongst those people. In another hadith, it's mentioned that will, the angel will come and say, what did you say about this man Muhammad sallallahu And he'll reply, well, what he used to say that is that He's Allah's servant and messenger. And he used to say that I've witnessed there's no true God except Allah and that Muhammad is his servant messenger. And they'll say, we know you used to say that. And his grave will be made larger, more spacious, more wider. To a distance of 74 arms length by 74 arms length. And his grave will be filled with light. And he'll be told, sleep, sleep. But he'll reply, let me go back to my family in order that I can tell them. They will say sleep, sleep just like the bridegroom who is awakened by the dearest of his family. Sleep, and then he will be allowed to sleep and rest. However, if that person was a hypocrite, his answer will be, when he's asked about the Prophet ﷺ, about Allah and about his religion, he'll say, I don't know. I heard people saying something, you know, so I used to just say what they were saying. Then they'll say, we know you used to say that. And then the earth will be commanded, come closer all around him to squash him. And it will come close to him. And it will keep on coming closer and closer and squeezing in. The grave will squeeze and squeeze and squeeze until it crushes his body to, so that his ribs will be overlocked, overlapping like that. Now would be Namidalik. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Yuthabbitu Allahu alladhina amanu bil qawli thabit fi al-hayati al-dunya wa fi al-akhirah Allah will keep firm those who believe with the word that stands firm in this world and the hereafter If you are amongst those who are firm in this world and you died upon that faith about the iman then this will be insha'Allah ta'ala you being firm in the hereafter. It will help you in the hereafter to answer these questions. In another hadith, or towards the end of the hadith, I'm going to just paraphrase it. He will say, the person will say, I read the book of Allah, the Quran, and had faith and belief in him. Then a caller, Allah will say, my servant said the truth, therefore furnish him from paradise, and let him wear from the clothes of paradise, and open a door for him to paradise. This is for the believer. So he'll be given 
The paradise is tranquility. A window will be opened up. He will smell the fragrance, the sweet smell of Jannah. A breeze will come through, a gentle breeze. And that will be the bliss for that person. His hayat wa barzakhiyya. And that will be the person who will then be given the good news. He will, that will be the indication that he will be from amongst the saved people, inshallah. And he will say that, hurry up with the commencement of the hour, meaning let the last day come quickly, come quickly. Why? He wants to meet Allah. He wants to go to what he's been promised to him. And then after the good person has been set up, after he's answered the questions, he'll be told, look at your seat in the fire. Allah has replaced it for you with a seat in paradise. Subhanallah. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, so he will see both those seats, both the places. What could have been for him in Jahannam, what is there for him in Jannah. And Qatada Radu'an says, we're told his grave will be enlarged up to 74 arms length and filled with greenery for him until the Day of Judgment. What about the state of the disbelievers after their questioning? As we mentioned that once the person has been placed in their grave and the last footsteps of the sandals of the person of the, of the shoes have gone, those two angels will come and make him sit up or make her sit up. And because they will not be able to answer those questions, correctly, then what will happen is that they will be given the tidings of the hellfire. For those people, they'll be told, put on them the clothes of hellfire. A window from the window of hellfire will be opened up. Through that window will come scorching, hot, burning air, filled with the stench of Jahannam. And he'll be told, this is the day that you've been promised. And then he'll ask the person giving him, or the angel asking him, giving him the bad news. And who are you? For yours is the face that brings about evil. And he'll say, I am your evil work. And the person then will have regret, will cry out, Oh my Lord, do not commence the hour. I mean, don't let the day of judgment come. Brothers and sisters, you know, there's a saying that says, seeing is believing. But that is not true necessarily. There are many things which we haven't seen. We haven't seen the atom or an electron. Yet people still believe in these things. Some people never seen China, really. We we'll believe in it. And so forth. As part of our religion, our iman, our faith, is that we believe in the unseen. الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ those who believe in the unknown, the unseen. We believe that the Prophet ﷺ, whatever was uttered from his lips is absolute truth. So when we're told that, the, uh, that about the soul, that the door of, uh, door of fire will be opened up to him if it was a, a rebellious evil person, we believe in that. If they disobeyed Allah, that will be their punishment. And we believe in the door of, or the windows of Jannah opening for the one who was a, a good believer. But because we can't see what's in the grave, if you were to open up a grave, dig into it, you will see a person, you will see a dead body, you will see maybe a skeleton. You would not see anything like fire or anything like that, or, because this is something of the ghayb, of the unknown to us. The interspace life, the hayat al-barzakhiyya, cannot be visualized, cannot be seen. Yet, for some, they can hear what's happening. The jinn, animals, they know, they can hear what is happening in the grave. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ said, regarding the people in the graves, those who were disbelievers and those who were sinners, they are punished and the animals hear it. That grave, for some people, will be the start of terrible punishments. And I'd like to remind us of the terrors of some of those punishments that will occur in the grave. In terms of a general cleanliness, the Prophet ﷺ informed us that the one 
who doesn't save themselves from urine on, in their clothes and the one who neglects a prayer for this person and the one who used to go around telling lies and spreading rumors about people such people will be punished in the grave in one hadith it says one of them used to eat the flesh of people meaning used to backbite and gossip another will have his grave filled with fire and be struck with a whip because he offered one prayer without wudu one prayer without wudu that punishment another who was he passed by somebody who was being wrong and didn't help him the scholars mentioned other incidents of the punishments of the grave being struck with an iron hammer the Prophet ﷺ in the meaning of the hadith when a person is placed in his grave and his companions leave and they can no longer hear the, the sound of the footsteps he mentions that after he's been shown about his place in hell Allah is, uh, then he's, for that person he'll be asked or he'll be told for example the hypocrite when he says I do not know I saw what people said and he said to him you did not know and you did not follow those who knew then such a person will be struck with a blow with an iron hammer between his ears and he'll scream such a scream that everything around him can hear except for the two races of mankind and jinn in another narration we, we hear that the people will be given the furnishings of hell meaning they'll be given clothes of fire to wear the door from hell being opened for them the grave being made narrow being struck with a hammer a hammer of which if it was, it was to hit a mountain it would turn into dust and of course this will be in on top of this he'll be made known it be made known to him he's going to be amongst people hellfire in fact in the hadith which is mentioned by the Prophet that he once narrated a dream to his companions he said last night two people came to me in a dream woke me up and said let's go I set out with them and we came across a man who was lying down and another man standing over him holding a big rock he threw the rock at the man's head smashing it the rock rolled away and the one who had been thrown it followed up and picked it up by the time he came back the man to the man his head had been restored to its former state the head had grown back again then he did the same as before same as before he did again so he said to his two companions in the dream subhanallah who are these two people they said move on so we went on and came to a man who was lying flat on his back and another man standing over him holding an iron hook he put the hook in the man's mouth and tore off that side tore off that side of his face to the back of his neck and he tore his nose and his eye from front to back in a similar manner from here right to the back he put the hook and tore the man's nose and eye from the front to the back in a similar manner then he turned to the other side of man's face and did likewise no sooner had he finished the second side but the first side was restored to its former state then he went back and did the same thing again and he said I said to my two companions subhanallah who are these two persons they said move on move on so he moved on went on and came to something like a tanur like a, a clay oven and what he found that he says that I think the Prophet said in that oven there was much noise and voices the Prophet added we looked into it and saw naked men and women a flame of fire was reaching them from underneath and when it reached them they cried out loud, loudly I asked them who are these they said move on so went on and came to a river and I think he said red like blood in the river there was a man swimming and on the bank there was a man who had gathered many stones whilst the swimmer was swimming the man who had gathered the stones approached him the swimmer opened his mouth and the man on the bank threw a stone into it and the swimmer carried on swimming each time he came back he threw another stone threw another stone I said to my two companions who are these two people they said move on move on I said to them this is the Prophet Sallallahu speaking I said to them I've seen many wonders this night what do all these things mean they said we will tell you the first man you came across whose head was being smashed with a stone with a rock is the man who studies the Quran that he neither recites it nor acts upon it and he goes to sleep neglecting the obligatory prayers the man you came across whose nose mouth and ears were being torn from the front to the back 
is the man who goes out of his house in the morning and tells a lie so serious that it spreads all over the world. The naked men and women whom we saw in a structure that resembled an oven are the adulterers and adulteresses. The man you saw swimming in the river with rocks being thrown into his mouth is the one who, who consumed, who ate usury, interest, riba. And this, commenting on this hadith, al hafiz ibn Hajar, rahimullah, he said, this indicates that some sinners will be punished in al-barzakh, meaning between the time, between being resurrected and the time they put in the grave. So brothers and sisters, these are some of the terrible punishments which people will be facing in the grave. There's no doubt about this. These are from the, the narrations of the authentic narrations of the Prophet ﷺ. Yet, despite this, how many people are still heedless, are still involved in such sins and many others besides this? The punishment of the grave are for the sins of the mouth, of the hands, of the eyes, the ears, the whole body. The sins that we do, we will not be able to run from them. As we said, as believers, we have true faith in these aspects of the grave, that there will be punishment. So who are the intelligent ones? The intelligent ones are those who think about protecting themselves against these terrible punishments before it's too late. They're the ones who know with full yaqeen, with full certainty that this day will come when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a day which will come without any warning to us. They know this day is going to come. We should know this. It's a day that we return to Allah. A day that we have to have fear of. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <clears throat> وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا تُرَجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ ثُمَّ تُوَفَّى كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا كَسَبَتْ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ And be afraid of the day. Be afraid of the day when you shall be brought back to Allah. Then every person shall be paid for what he earned and they shall not be dealt with unjustly. When this day comes, brothers and sisters, we leave behind everything. We leave behind our fathers, our mothers. We leave behind our husbands and wives. We leave behind our brothers and sisters. We leave behind our children. We leave behind our wealth, our houses, our cars, our clothes, everything we had of significance in this world, we'll leave it. Except we go to our graves with our amal, our actions. We go with our actions. And the actions are either two. Amal salihat, righteous actions. Or amal sayyat, evil actions. There's no in between. There's no hybrid. It's either evil actions or good actions, that's it. That's what we take with us. We take nothing else, no money, no clothes, nothing. We'll be wrapped in a shroud. The day that we were born, we enter into the grave. That's it. So what will we do? When will we open our eyes? When we will start to hear and regret? When will we be serious that that day will come to us without being announced to us. We will never be ready for that day, and it will come to us. A day that when we enter into the pangs of death, will be regret for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed us what to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Sabiqu ila maghfiratim min rabbikum Race to forgiveness from your Lord. Sabiqu ila maghfiratim min rabbikum wa jannatin arduha ka ardu al-sama'i wal-ardu. 
race to the forgiveness from your Lord and the garden, a Jannah, whose breadth is like the breadth of the heaven and the earth. It's prepared for those who have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in His messengers. Those who obeyed Allah, those who obeyed the messengers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent and the prophets, those are the people who will have benefit in the akhirah. In that place, brothers and sisters, only good actions will be of use to us. The actions that we do in this life will determine your place in the hereafter, your status, your makan, your maqam in the akhirah. Whether you're in the lower levels of Jannah or in the highest levels of Jannah, this you determine from now through your free choice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of your own free choice. La ikraf al deen. There's no compulsion in the religion. But it's up to you. Whether you pray X, if you pray the Sunnah prayers or not, whether you pray X and Nawafil, whether you keep Sunnah fast or not, whether you give Sadaqah apart from giving your Zakah and any other voluntary actions, it's up to you. You will determine the final outcome through these actions. Of course, nobody will enter into Jannah except by Allah's mercy. So, first and foremost, we always ask for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. Brothers and sisters, the grave, the grave will be a residence. It will be a home for us, even though it's going to be a temporary one. But in that life, Hayat al-Barzakhiyah, the interspace life, it will be a place, a time, time will not have essence. It will be irrelevant. You will not know what minutes, seconds, days, years are. You will not know what's happening. And either that time will be a terrible time of torment and punishment for you, or it will be a time to enjoy until you get to the next stage. So determine how your Hayat al-Barzakhiyah will be in this life. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from the trials of the life and death. Allahumma inna na'udhika min adhab al-qabr wa na'udhika min fitnat al-mahya wal-mamat. Allahumma inna na'udhika min adhab al-qabr. Oh Allah, we ask you, we ask refuge from you from the punishment of the grave. Allahumma, oh Allah, nawr quburna ba'd al-mawt. Make our graves with light after we die. وَوَسِّعْ قُبُورَنَا بَعْدِ الْمَوْتِ O oh Allah, make our graves spacious for us after our death. وَفْتَحْ لَنَا نَافِضَةً مِنْ نَافِثِ الْجَنَّةِ And open for us a window from the window of Jannah. And a gentle breeze and a fragrance. O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make us amongst those who you have mercy in the graves and not from amongst those who receive your anger and your punishment. سبحانك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين وجزاكم الله خير والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله